I thank you to the Lord for the opportunity of being here with you all. It's really something special for me to be here on the headquarters of our church. Uh, when I met the church, I was 15 years old, and I always thought about the headquarters of the, our general conference of our church, where we have our lessons prepared and many materials that go around the world. And I never thought I would have the opportunity of being here one day. And then that's why it's very special for me, and I'm very thankful to the Lord for being here this morning. And I wish that we may have a good time together here this morning, worshiping God, studying His Word. And when we leave this place, may the Lord bless us that we live with the assurance that we met Jesus Christ here. Amen. Mm -hmm. And before starting the message for this morning, I want to ask you to pray in your hearts that the Holy Spirit be with us and that the Lord may reach our hearts according to His will. Amen. If we were to give a theme for this mess message to this morning, I would give the theme, Passing the Test. A young man had just finished his studies on the missionary college, and he applied to work as a missionary. As the board of the church was very busy, they appointed a experienced minister to test the young man to see if, if he was prepared, if he had the qualifications to be a missionary. And then the elderly minister, he appointed a time to meet the young man. And on the appointed time, the young man came to his office. When the minister arrived in his office, office entered there, he told to the young man, Let's begin. First, please spell Baker. B A K E R. Spell the applicant. Very good. Let's see what you know about fingers. How much is two times two? Four, said the young man. Very good. I recommend to the border tomorrow that you be appointed. You have passed the test. At the beginning of that meeting with the board, the examiner spoke highly about the applicant and said, he has all the qualifications of a missionary. Let me explain. First, I tested him on self-denial. I told him to be at my house at 3 a.m. He left his warm bed and walked to my office. Without a word of complaint, he appeared on time. Second, I examined him on patience by making him wait five hours after telling him to be at my office at 3 o'clock in the morning, I went to see him at 8 in the morning. Further, I tested his temper, and he showed no signs of disgust or questioned my long delay. Then I tested him in humility by asking him questions that a small child could answer and he showed no offense. He passed the entire test. It was very little the test made with this young man, but he passed the test. He wanted to be a missionary. And according to the Word of God in the Desire of Ages, page 195, every true disciple is born to the kingdom of God as a missionary. It means that you and I, 
we are missionaries. Now the question is, do we pass the test? When are, are we facing the tests? God tells us when we are facing the tests. Fourth testimony, page 561. The little incidents of everyday life often pass without our notes. But it is, but it is these things that shape the character. Every event of life is a great for good or for evil. The mind needs to be trained by daily tests that it may acquire power to stand in any difficult position. Then when are we tested? Daily. Every moment we are facing tests in little things. In the day of trials and peril, you will need to be fortified to stand firmly for the right, independent of every opposing influence, and to be read to stand when we face the great trials. We have to pass the test in the little trials that come as every moment in our life. You can ask yourself, do, you, do I pass the test? when I face the test of self-denial. Self Let's see what Christ told to the disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 38. And he that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. It was very deep words that Christ spoke to the disciples. He told that they had to take their cross and follow him. And that's interesting that, that the spirit of prophecy says that they didn't understand what Christ told them here completely. To the disciples, his words, though dimly comprehended, pointed to their submission to the most bitter humiliation. Christ was telling them that they, as missionaries, they would have to suffer bitter humiliation. He was require, requiring from them this, self-denial. They had to deny themselves. When I went to the CD of the Spirit of Prophecy and I put the word humility, came out Men quotes from the spirit of prophecy bring the word humility. Then I put self-denial, and I found more than 3,000 quotes. Three times times that these were two words, words appear on the spirit of prophecy. Then it's something very important. That's why Christ told to the disciples they should take their cross. They should deny themselves. That's what it means. <clears throat> but he gave the example... For us first, before telling us to deny ourselves, he denied himself. Desire of Ages, page 416. Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. He left the heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult and a death of shame. He who was rich in heaven's priceless treasure became poor that though his poverty, through his poverty, we might be rich, we are to follow in the path he trod. And how can we partake of Christ's self-denial today? In our daily life. And how must we partake of his self-denial? What can we do to be partakers of his self denying. Let's read in First Corinthians chapter nine, verse twenty seven. But I keep under my body 
and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Then Paul said, I keep under my body. That's how we can partake of Christ's self-denial. How can we follow, how we can follow his example in self-denial. When we keep under subject, subjection our own body. When we want to do something that we really know that wouldn't be the best. Then we keep ourselves off doing it. Even if it brings pressure. Even if it seems that it brings joy in the first place. But we know it's not for the glory of God. That it's going to be a problem for us or for somebody else in the future. We have to keep it in subjection. Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. For to me live is Christ, and to die is gain. Even if we are called to lay our life down and put all the energy into the work that lays before us, the work God wants us to do, we must be willing. Even if the flesh doesn't like it, we have to bring it under. Subjection. And be willing to do what the Lord wants us to do. The last hymn we saw, sang in the Sabbath school, it said we are willing to go or to stay according to the will of God. Then when God calls us to go somewhere we don't like, we wouldn't like to go, we must be willing to go or to stay. If we do so, if we live for Christ, that's a real life. Then we pass the test on self-denial. How about when we are, we are tested on patience? Do we pass the test? Do you pass the test? I want to share with you like, the experience of a young teacher that worked taking care of 40 children. 40, 40 children. And after a long day with those children, she was ready to go home. But before going home, she had to dress the children with the clothes to go home and put on their shoes. And she started one by one putting their shoes on. And many of those shoes were with laces. And she had to tie the laces. When she came to the last child, she put his shoes on then he, the child looked at her and said, These are not my shoes. And she said, Whoa, what happened? I messed all it up. And I, how, am I, how am I going to know which one is his shoes? And she went with him around, asking, Is this your shoes? Looking at the feet of the other children, she asked, Is this yours? He said, No, it's not mine. And she looked for his shoes and she couldn't find it. Finally, she was tired. Then she sat on the floor, very tired. And he looked at her and said, and she had already taken out his shoes. Then he said, these shoes are not mine, it's my brother's shoes, but my mother told me to wear it today. <laughs> According to the story I read, she just smiled. She didn't, get ang she didn't get angry with the child. She passed the test. Would I pass the test? Would you pass the test? Let's read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse, I mean chapter 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. It says, be patient toward all men. It's very easy for us to be patient with some people that we really like. But here the Bible says, be patient toward all men. And it includes the children. 
Sometimes it's hard to be patient with our children, with other children. But the Bible says, be patient with all men. With everybody, we have to be patient. Do we pass the test? It's very important to pass the test on patience. The Word of God says that we can win souls to Christ if we are patient, especially when the trials come. When it's hard to be patient, when nobody else would be patient, then Christ is there with us and we got to be patient. It will make a difference in others' life. When he who is a co-worker with Christ presses home the truth to the sinner's heart with patience and love. The voice of love speaks through the human instrumentality. Heavenly intelligence work with a consecrated human agent. And the spirit operates upon the soul of the unbeliever. Then Christ is there. The Holy Spirit is there. If we pass the test on patience. Be also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Patience, as well as courage, has victories. Then sometimes we admire people that uh, have great courage, that is ready to face anything that comes before them. Because usually this kind of people, they are over overcomers, right? And we admire them. And we want to be like them. We want to have courage. But here it says that patience as well as courage has its victories. Then we want to be patient also. And we want to pass the test by meekness under trial, no less than by boldness in enterprise. Souls may be one to Christ. Acts of Apostles, chapter, uh, page 465. And... Luke chapter 21, verse 19. Let's see how important it is for us to pass the test of patience. Luke chapter 21, verse 19. In your patience possess ye your souls. Then Christ said that in your patience we possess our souls. Would it be wrong if we just go a little, a little bit beyond and say, in our patience, we possess our souls and other souls? Because when we have a spirit with patience, it brings an influence upon others' life. And it leads them, it leads them to Jesus Christ. And according to the quote we just read, by our patience, we, may, we might win souls to Christ. James chapter 1, verse 19. James chapter 1, verse 19 says the word of God. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. He is slow to speak, he is slow to wrath. Especially when somebody comes and says something against us. Something we don't like. Then the word of God says, Be very swift to hear. Be slow to speak and be slow to wrath. Because the natural tendency of men, our natural tendency, is when somebody says something we don't like, in the same moment, we give it back. We pay back. But Christ makes a difference in our life. And that's the difference he wants to make. Bring, give us patience. In such a way that we can bear things that we don't like. And we can stay quiet. When we see something we don't like, we may stay quiet. And wait for an opportunity to help that soul. It's not always in, the ver in that very moment that we are going to say something that's going to help. To make a difference in that life for better. Many times when we are so ready to speak, we may make a difference, but not for better, for worse. That's why the Word of God says, Be swift to hear, is slow to speak, and is slow to wrath. 
How about when we are, we are testing humility? First of all, what is, what is humility? I went to the dictionary to see what humility means, and it says, Humility is when, in spite of your achievements of being successful, you are modest. Then it means when we come to a high position, when we achieve the goals we had, we are glad because we got there, but we still are modest. Wasn't the lack of humility that brought the final destruction to Herod? Herod. Hmm? Let's see now the, the, what the Bible tells about humility. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. It looks for me as a definition of humility comes, coming from the Bible. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Then the Bible is saying here that humility is when we don't think highly of ourselves or more highly than we ought to think. There is a saying that says, I wish I could buy that person for what she is worth and sell her for what she thinks she is worth. <coughs> Did you understand? Mm -hmm. It would make some of, of, of us rich <laughs> if we could buy a person that has no humility, but that's proud of himself. And if we could buy him for what he thinks he's worth and sell him for what he... Did I make it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we could buy the person, buy what the person is worth and sell for what she thinks she is worth, it would make a great difference. First Peter chapter five, verse five. First Peter 5, verse 4 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. That's why we want to be humble. We, we want to have humility in our lives. Because God, he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. We can account on the grace of God if we are humble. Sometimes we may seem to lose something coming to our, from men, but we are going to receive things coming from God. His grace is the most important thing we can have in our lives. And it says here that the younger should submit to the elder then the youth must be submissive to the elderly people. Because, you know, sometimes we that are young, we may think we know more than the elderly people. Because, you know, we went to the university lately, uh, lately and when they passed there, the university didn't have what the university has today. And they don't know as much as we know. But it's not always true. They have something we don't have. I heard about a young man that went to university. He lived in the country, and he left his parents, and he went to the city, to the university. And he was a very simple young man. And when he got there, he was amazed with the university, oh, with everything they had there. And it started enchanting him. And he started chanting his way of living. And finally, one day, his father came to visit him. And he was with his friends in his house. And his father, very, a very simple 
man, very, very Christian man. When he arrived there, he started sharing with his friends, some with the friends of his son, some of uh, the truth he knew from the Bible. He started sharing the gospel with his friends, with the friends of his son. And then his son got ashamed of his father and he said, Oh, my friends, they have their minds so open. And my father has his mind closed and just think about the Bible. And then to distract his father, he gave his father a book of geography. And he said, Father, read here. You are going to discover wonderful things in this book. It's a wonderful book. I got to know many things that I had never imagined when I started reading this book. And his father said, okay. Then his father, very glad, opened the book and started reading that book. And suddenly his father said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Then his son got more ashamed yet. And he said, what happened, father? And he said, you know, in this book here, it's talking about the ocean. And it says that there are places in the ocean that are so dark, so deep, that men could never get there. Men has never been able to get there. And you know, the Bible says that God, he cast my, all my sins there. Then I'm so glad because nobody's going to know my sins. Amen. Then, that was the lesson his father gave him. And, but it goes a little bit beyond the verse that we read here. It says, Peter 5.5 5 says, Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Then in other words, it means also that sometimes the elders should also be subject to the youth. Because we have things to learn with each other. Right? In other words, the elders and the young people, we all must have humility and be humble so the Lord can give us His grace. <clears throat> Talk about humility, says the spirit of prophecy in five Bible commentary, 1139. Humility is an active principle growing out of a thorough conscientiousness of God's great love. And we always show itself by the way in which it works. It's something that comes by the conscientiousness of God's presence and great love in our lives. That amazes me because, you know, we, in other words, it's saying, it's telling us here that we can be humble just when we understand how much God loves us. When we feel the love of God in our lives then we have humility. We are enabled to be humble. And just the love of God can work it out in our lives. When the prodigal son was far from his home, what brought him back home? It wasn't because he was hungry. He was hungry, but it was not what brought him back home. He was facing the cold weather. He was cold. But it was not that that brought him home. It's said in the word of God that the lo the fa his father's love touched his heart and moved him towards home. And we must uh, be humble enough also to face the trials that come among us and that we have to face from outside. And one of the hardest trials that might come to us is when we are doing the best we can to help somebody and that person doesn't recognize it and criticize us. Right? It's written in the Spirit of Prophecy that it is one of the hardest trials we can suffer. We, might, we have to face. is when we are trying to help somebody or even the church, we are trying to help the church to do the best we can. And then it seems that nobody recognizes our work. It seems it's not doing any difference in others' life. And somebody may even, as I said, start criticizing us. What we should, should we do? 
if we understand the love of God for us, what are we going to do? When others talk about us and when others don't like us, even when we love them, we want to help them, we want to save them, we want to see them in the kingdom of God. And they don't understand it, and they don't understand us. And they criticize us. I will share with you one more experience. I received this by email, a story, saying about a donkey that fell on a dried well. Then his owner found out that he had, fell, had fall, fallen there on the well, and he, his owner was thinking, how can I take the donkey out of this well? And he couldn't find a way. Then he called his neighbors to help him. And the neighbors came. And the neighbor said, you know, if we tie a rope around him, try to pull him out, we probably are going to kill him and he's going to suffer a lot. It's too deep, the well, to take the donkey out of the well. And after wondering about what they could do, they finally decided, you know, the best thing we can do is throw, throw dirty on the well, so we cover the donkey, and we kill him, we kill it, and he's not going to suffer much, and that's the best we can do to help him. The owner didn't want to agree with that, but he couldn't find another solution. He said, okay, to don't let him suffer more, let's do it. And they got the shovels and they started throwing dirty there on the well, and they were working as fast as, as fast as they, they could. And after a while, they saw something appearing, coming out from the well, and they looked at it, it was the donkey's head. And they said, what is happening? Then they continued throwing dirt there, and they started observing, and they saw that when they threw the dirty on the Duck, dunk is bad, he would shake it. He would shake his back and would step on the dirty. What it made, made that the, the well start filling up and the duck finally came out. That is what Christ wants us to do. When we are misunderstood, when we receive criticism, we should step on it and come out of it. One day, after I finished that sermon in the church, <coughs> a person came to me and said, Brother, what's happening to your English? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. What, what do you mean? And the person said, It's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> and I really didn't like that uh, commentary, you know. <laughs> but I just I was just quiet and I smiled. And I thought, what should I do now? And I said, I know what I have to do. I have to shake my back, step on it, and go up. And how can I do that? I said, I have to study more because it may be helpful for me if I don't let it be in my bed, disturbing me. Because if I just keep thinking, oh, that person is so rude, how come that she would say that? I would be keeping the dirt on my bed. And we are going to receive a lot of dirt, a great amount that's going to cover us, cover us and kill our Christian life. Amen. We have to shake it by the grace of Christ step on it and come out of it. <clears throat> and if, if we do so, says the Spirit of Prophecy, we are doing the very things Christ did. It's an act that symbolizes the condition of the mind and the heart. It will be showing that we have Jesus Christ in our lives if we pass the test. And we have to pass the test because Paul said, 
that he put his body under that he could pass the test because he didn't want to preach to others and him himself be a castaway. And we don't want to be a castaway. We want to pass the test on patience, on self-denial, in temper, and humility. What do we need to pass the test? We need Jesus Christ. We need to understand the love of God and feel His love moving our hearts. Because if we understand how much He loves us, we will grow in a personal experience with Jesus Christ. And He's going to enable us to overcome every day. And if we fail on the test, we don't have reason to be discouraged because we still have opportunity to do another test. This week I was talking to a sister and she told me that she made all the tests in, in school when she was finishing high school and she failed in one test. She couldn't go through that test. But finally, she persevered. She went to sc- back to school. She tried again. And finally, she passed the test that she needed to get her diploma. And Christ said that if we persevere, we are the ones that are going to pass the test. Do you remember where he says that? For closing, re- let's read in Matthew. Twenty-four, verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We must get hold of Christ's hand and persevere till we pass the test. Till we feel that God loves us. Till he feel, we feel His love in our lives. We feel that we can pass the test because He is with us. Amen. 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 In the name of Jesus, we come before thee once again. We want to say thank you, Lord, for the blessings we have received from thy hands. We are thankful, Father, for the privilege we have of meeting here together to worship thee with freedom. Now, Father, we ask you the forgiveness of our sins. Forgive the wrong we have done. And also, Lord, forgive the right we should have done and we did it. Lord, we know that we must pass the test. We realize that we cannot pass the test by ourselves. And Lord, we know that through Jesus Christ, we can pass the test. Please, Father, help us to feel thy presence with us. May your love move our hearts. Change our lives in such a way that others may see Jesus in us. And might also desire to be part of thy family. Lord, once again, we give you our lives, and we ask you to do for us more than we even know how to ask, because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.